In 2012, Benedict Cumberbatch took Twitter drama to the BAFTA Film Awards. While presenting an award to Sherlock and Doctor Who showrunner Stephen Moffat, he announced, He's a loving and non-misogynist husband to the equally brilliant but far more beautiful wife, Sue Virtue. A non-misogynist, he called him, because that was the accusation that Moffat was a misogynist. And Moffat was at his peak at this time, running two of the most expensive and popular BBC shows of the time, achieving the sort of rock star fame, or at least Tumblr fame, few TV writers do. But he couldn't seem to shake these accusations that he could only write women as sexist caricatures. And new Doctor Who companion Amy Pond was at the centre of the drama. Amy was far too sexy in her short skirts and it made people super friggin' uncomfortable. Amy actress Karen Gillan came to the show's defence a few times saying she chose those skirts herself, it was just the fashion of the time, and that Moffat as a mere writer never had a say in or cared about what she was wearing. But is this true? We know for sure that he at least had some opinions about her looks from the beginning, as he said when he first saw an audition video of her. I thought, well she's really good, it's just a shame that she's so wee and dumpy. And then when she was about to uh, come into the audition I nipped out for a minute. And I saw Karen walking along the corridor towards me. I realised she's five foot eleven, slim and gorgeous. I thought, oh, oh, that'll probably work. But even if he hadn't considered her looks or her skirt beforehand, his future scripts definitely included references to Amy's clothes and body. In the mini episode Space and Time, the plot actually revolves around Amy's skirt. Amy's husband Rory is working on fixing the Doctor's time machine, the TARDIS, but he gets distracted when he looks up through the glass floor and sees up Amy's short skirt. <gasps> This causes Rory to mess up his work and the TARDIS goes haywire and an adventure ensues. It kind of was her fault. How could it be her fault? Because it was my skirt and my husband and your glass floor. Oh, Rory! Sorry. And all this chaos because of Amy's short skirt. Pond put some trousers on. This guy heard of feminism and the glass ceiling and his question was, what if feminists were standing on it in a short skirt? But in all fairness, short skirts on the companion are nothing new to Doctor Who. Whether a hip girl from the swinging 60s like Polly or a scientist like Dr Liz Shaw, the companions often wore short skirts in the classic series. Caroline John, who played Liz, says that when filming a story set in underground caves, she was told that she had to keep the short skirt on. He said, you're not wearing that down the caves. I said, John, they won't let me wear anything but these short skirts, which actually, because we didn't wear coloured tights in those days, revealed everything practically. She was only allowed to get into more appropriate clothing because the actor who played the Doctor, John Pertwee, stepped in and had a go at some people. And obviously the point was that Doctor Who needed eye candy. Producers such as John Nathan Turner in the 80s would refer to the female companions as something for the dads. Because of course adult men can't be expected to enjoy family television unless there's scantily clad women in it. When companion Nyssa went from a skirt to trousers, fan complaints led Nathan Turner to put her back in a skirt so as to not upset the dads. Daddies. Nicola Bryant, who played Perry in the mid-80s, was expected to wear very little at all times. In one case, shooting on location in freezing temperatures in barely any clothing. The costume was a huge problem on location. I got frostbite and pneumonia. When I saw my doctor, she said to me, what have you been doing? Standing outside with no clothes on? I went, yeah. I do remember our lovely cameraman, John, shouting at one point, Oh, just slap her, she's gone blue. Of course, you'd hope that the new Doctor Who would reflect the feminism of the 2010s, where John Pertwee had to stick up for his companion's right to not wear a short skirt in a cave, you'd hope the same would be true today. So anyway, here's Amy in underground caves wearing a short skirt. Of course, this is the same story where, at the end, Amy takes the Doctor to bed with her and tries to hook up with him. Amy doesn't believe that the Doctor isn't interested in her, she's convinced he took her with him because he fancies her. So to prove that the Doctor chooses his female companions based on his attraction to them, she asks the TARDIS to show her visual records of all previous TARDIS inhabitants. The images the TARDIS shows Amy excludes all of the male companions, excludes his granddaughter, and excludes the robot companions, proving to Amy that she's right about the Doctor. A similar scene happens later with Clara where the TARDIS shows her pictures of the girls the Doctor has brought home. The point being to prove that the Doctor is not only interested in women, but chooses his companions based on how attractive he finds them. Which is definitely an interpretation. Unfortunately that implies that the Doctor chose teenage girls such as Ace and Zoe because he was attracted to them. This adorable paternal relationship we enjoyed so much between the Doctor and Ace was actually him being a big old perv apparently. When Ace was 16, this Doctor was apparently attracted to her according to Moffat's suggestion, potentially rewriting the entirety of Doctor Who history as incredibly creepy, thank you so much Moffat. But this wasn't how the Doctor was played or written in the classic series. As Tom Baker so eloquently put it, the Doctor was flying around the universe with no d**k 
and a sonic screwdriver. You're a beautiful woman, probably. The classic doctors were, or at least appeared to be, asexual. Besides one dubious romance in 1964 and another apparent romance in 1996, there was a good 32 years where the doctor expressed zero interest in romantic relationships, let alone sexy ones. But if that's the case, then why does the Doctor travel around the universe with a pretty young woman? Well, in the very first episode, way back in 1963, the Doctor was travelling with his granddaughter Susan. The show had been carefully designed as a family show to appeal to the broadest possible audience. You had the mad scientist, the Doctor, who travelled in time and caused trouble. You had his granddaughter Susan, a young girl who children could relate to and see this world through. They specifically made her his granddaughter so as to make sure it didn't seem creepy that this young girl was travelling with this old guy. And because it was meant to be educational, you also had the two human companions, Ian, a science teacher, and Barbara, a history teacher. Ian's science skills would come in handy in episodes set in the future, teaching the audience about science, and Barbara's history knowledge would come in handy in the past, teaching the audience about history. But the format gradually changed over the years and different roles would be merged. Where the male companion had really had the heroic role, that would eventually be merged with the Doctor. The woman and the girl's roles would be merged as well. After Susan and Barbara left, the Doctor would regularly have a young woman travelling with him, and echoing the Doctor's relationship with his granddaughter, they would usually have a father-daughter type of relationship. Moffat himself has said that this magic man with a child relationship is still the dynamic today. The basis of the relationship between the Doctor and the companion really is a magic man from space and a child. That's yeah. fundamentally what it is. It's not a it's not boyfriend and girlfriend, it's not husband and wife, God knows. It's actually a magic man from space who can take you away and mean you never go have to go back to school and a child. And an important part of the companion's job was to ask questions, to provide exposition, to help the audience understand what was happening. What's happening, Doctor? What's happening, Doctor? What's happening, Doctor? Doctor, what's happening? Doctor, what's happening? Doctor, what's happening? Doctor, what's happening? What's going on? The Doctor is so big and epic and magical. If he's left on his own, the audience won't have a clue what's happening. So you need the companion to communicate the context. You need Watson to make sense of Sherlock. You also need Watson to be the audience surrogate, the everyman, to make Sherlock truly shine. This show was designed and refined into an almost perfect format to make this whole adventure through time and space thing work. But what this has meant for the majority of the last 60 years is that the great hero of the show is the male character. He's older, he's smarter, he's braver. The Doctor is the hero. Whereas the companion, the Doctor Who girl, as she's sometimes called, is young. She's not as intelligent. She's prone to a cheeky kidnapping. She's the damsel. But the rise of Doctor Who took place at the same time as the rise of second wave feminism. So by the early 70s, showrunners found themselves confronted with a problem. The formula of their show versus feminism. There was always the threat that something vile would be done to our, our beautiful and virginal young heroine. So in my case, it was intentional sexism. I feel the right place for the heroine is strapped to the circular saw, screaming her head off till the doctor comes to rescue her. But it was becoming obvious we couldn't get away with that anymore. Where the previous companion had been a wide-eyed girl, there to ask questions and be rescued by the doctor, Sarah Jane Smith was introduced as a feminist and a journalist, a woman who ran on her own steam, who in her first story ends up rescuing the doctor repeatedly. We need somebody around here to make the coffee. If you think I'm going to spend my time making cups of coffee for you, women's liberation, your majesty. On earth it means, well very briefly, it means that we women don't let men push us around. She's not just asking questions because she doesn't understand what's happening, she's asking questions because as an investigative journalist, that's her job. But ultimately the role of the companion is still the same. What's Sarah Jane still needs to get captured and be rescued by the Doctor because he's the hero and that's the formula of the show. They start off very strongly, they end up very weakly, they end up screaming. <coughs> They lose all their character after the first few stories and they just become, they're just there as, as a tool to carry the bit of the story. Attempts to make the companion equal to the Doctor creates an awkward dynamic. When a fellow Time Lord, Romana, was introduced as the companion, you ended up with two geniuses, three if you count the robot dog, none of which are particularly relatable to the average viewer. Smart, independent companions don't necessarily make for good, useful companions within the structure of the show. It seems that the companion can never be truly equal to the Doctor because that interferes with too many other functions of the companion role. 
We need to relate to her. She needs to be able to ask the questions we would want to ask. Because another role of the companion is to act as an audience surrogate. Someone for us to connect to and say, ah, that would be me in this situation. But do you always relate to the girl? When you look at Tegan running around alien planets in high heels, do you relate to that character? As Tegan actress Janet Fielding once said, If you're a young girl and you're watching that series and you see a companion climbing a cliff face in a pair of two inch heels and a tight skirt, you don't think poor actress, what idiot made her climb a cliff in two inch high heels and a tight skirt, you think, what a bimbo. You don't identify with the female characters, you identify with the intelligent, go-getting characters. But why would this character, who's meant to be relatable to the audience, be dressed like this? Well, as 80s Doctor Who producer John Nathan Turner told the press about Perry actress Nicola Bryant, she'll often be wearing leotards and bikinis. A lot of dads watch Doctor Who and I'm sure they will like Nicola. When asked about the assertion that the girl companions were for the dads, Nathan Turner replied, I think if you're regarding that as a sexist remark, I think you're being hypersensitive. Companions have a very complex role to fill. If one of them relates to audience identification of the male species, then I'm, I'm sorry if you think that that is sexist. Perry is a pretty awful companion, and her relationship with the Doctor is deeply uncomfortable and very difficult to watch. Unsurprisingly, putting the attractiveness of Perry before her characterization wasn't a winning idea. A lot of bad decisions like this meant that Doctor Who was cancelled in 1989, only returning in 2005, now starring Billy Piper as the companion, with Christopher Eccleston and later David Tennant as the Doctor. What we've jettisoned is the sexism of the underwritten female role. Granted, Billy Piper is nothing if not incredibly beautiful, but objectified she was not. She's not styled to be sexy, she's styled to be a working class 19 year old living on a council estate in 2005. And the role of the companion was greatly expanded at this point. We now had season long arc structured around the journey of the companion. We enter into the story with Rose. We're gradually introduced to the Doctor and the TARDIS as she is. The season is about her and her relationships, which now include not only the Doctor, but also her boyfriend, her mum, and her dead father, who she travels back in time to meet. I think it's important to, to take all these science fiction ideas and treat them as real, I mean emotionally real. And each companion carries on this new formula where seasons are grounded by the companion's story, not the Doctor's. She is as important to the story as he is, regardless of whether she's the hero or not. When Martha meets the Doctor, she's running away from the drama of her family and her parents' divorce. She has a crush on the Doctor and he represents an exciting escape, but he doesn't reciprocate her feelings, and their adventures end up putting her family in grave danger. Even though she helps save the world, by the end of her season she's no longer interested in being strung along by the Doctor, and is ready to take responsibility for what happened to her family. I spent a lot of time with you thinking I was second best, but you know what? I am good. <laughs> so the Companion's arc is not some big spacey wacy adventure, it's about very real human experiences that even quite young people can relate to. These Companions sometimes live with their mums, their students. Donna's story is in large part about how her mum puts her down and how that affects her self esteem. Donna in particular proves that a companion doesn't have to be very young in order to connect with very young audiences. Despite being the hero, the Doctor has one major weakness. He is essentially static. He can fill many roles and he knows all about the universe, but his life and his outlook need to stay essentially the same. But the companion, on the other hand, has enormous capacity for change and development. The companion has the potential to be interesting and dynamic in a totally different way, and the new series really played to that strength. You can see it with Martha, who has a family and a career, and who not only underwent her own journey in her first season, but journeyed on in future seasons, also guest starring in the spin-off show Torchwood, and she could come back to the show at any time with a whole new life, and I'd be willing to bet that she is going to do that one of these days. Companions get to have rich personal lives in ways the Doctor will never be able to, because he's kind of trapped in the format of the show. And Russell T Davis took advantage of this to make the women central and vital to the show. They were as much the stars as the Doctors were, and they were certainly no longer for the dads. Instead, they were the everyman, the Watson, the audience surrogate. Despite the inherent sexism of the Doctor Companion formula, the show became more balanced by making sure we properly saw this world through the Companion's eyes. And then, Stephen Moffat took over, introducing the new companion, Amy Pond, the Kissagram. We first meet Amy as a little girl briefly, and we do see the world through her eyes for a few wonderful moments there, but then we hop to the future and meet her as an adult, and we don't see the world through her eyes anymore. We see her 
through the doctor's eyes. Literally his gaze as he looks up her long legs to her face the first time he sees grown up Amy. And rather than entering into the doctor's world through Amy, we see the doctor's perspective as he keeps various secrets from Amy. You asked me why I was taking you with me and I said, no reason, I was lying. We watch as he keeps from her the mystery of the crack in her wall, then keeps the secret of her dead boyfriend Rory, then he keeps the secret of her pregnancy, then he melts her body without telling her what's happening. And although a lot happens to Amy, she remains relatively unfazed by it. She gets pregnant, is melted, has her baby kidnapped, finds out she actually grew up with her own baby as her best friend, and um, none of this really has an impact on her. Unlike Martha, she never chooses to separate from the Doctor. Her relationship to the Doctor doesn't seem to be at all emotionally impacted by the literal kidnapping of her baby who has never returned to her. It reminds me of various classic series companions like Nyssa whose whole planet is destroyed and now she's the last of the Trakans and the master has stolen her dead father's face and it just never comes up again. You would have these companions with interesting stories who would just stop developing because they just had to slip back into the role of the companion. So when Martha moves on from the doctor when something traumatic happens to her and her family, Amy just forgets the fact that she was kidnapped and her baby was stolen and never brought back to her because that would interfere with her role as the companion. Her first season arc about running away the night before her wedding, torn between the doctor and her fiance Rory, is resolved when she just temporarily forgets everything that happened this season, forgets the doctor exists and just marries Rory anyway. And the fact that Amy is more or less a sex worker and later a model is not a lens through which we get to see the world. I mean, it doesn't really even make sense for her to be a kissogram anyway in this tiny country village. And in the end, it's just a gag which never really comes up again. And the world doesn't treat Amy any differently for her being a glamorous model because this wasn't intended to be an insight into her world, the world of a woman who makes a living being attractive to men. It was just one showrunner's fantasy of a super sexy model who you could pay to kiss you and whose skirt you could see up through the glass floor, who climbs through caves without trousers on. This is in stark contrast to Rose, who would often be seen connecting to other working class women all throughout time and space. Rose's background isn't some fantasy, it shapes her characterization. It shapes how she sees the world and consequently how the viewers see it as well. While the doctor rubs elbows with the great and the rich, Rose introduces us to the working class, to the invisible people of space and time. She helps us connect our real world to the doctor's ridiculous one. Instead, Amy's story is about waiting for the doctor. The show repeatedly refers to her as the girl who waited. All the way up to the end of her run, two and a half seasons, she's still waiting for the doctor. The following companion, Clark, Clara's characterization is also repeatedly forgotten at the expense of her role as the companion. In her first season, she learns all about the Doctor's lives and regenerations, meeting multiple other versions of him. But two episodes later, when he regenerates into the next Doctor, she seems to not have a clue what's going on, forgetting everything that came before. Which makes sense for her role as companion, as audience surrogate. As the audience struggles to come to terms with the face of the new Doctor, so should Clara. But unfortunately, that doesn't make sense for her characterization as someone who has met like 12 different versions of the Doctor already. She knows regeneration probably better than almost any other companion, and yet she has to act clueless for the new viewers who may be confused about the concept of it. Her usefulness as a companion comes before her character. And once again, Clara was characterized as a fun mystery for the Doctor to solve. He kept meeting versions of Clara throughout history and they kept dying. The impossible girl, he called her. And again, he kept that mystery from her, actively wiping her memory at one point. But we, the viewers, were let in on it. We saw Clara through the Doctor's gaze. She would leave the TARDIS and we would linger on him, listening to his thoughts. Mystery wrapped in an enigma, squeezed into a skirt that's just a little bit too... And now that the gaze of the show had shifted away from the companion and into the Doctor, we also had a more sexual Doctor than ever before. As Moffat suggests, this Doctor seemed to be more interested in his companions because they were young and hot, squeezed into tight skirts. Jenny! <laughs> you have no idea how good that feels. In the show's 50 year history, the Doctor had never acted like this before, never made comments like that, and now suddenly he's making jokes with the sonic screwdriver when looking at women. So we, the viewer, now see the companion not as our surrogate, not as us, but for us. And this isn't the whole of the Revival series, this is specifically Stephen Moffat. I'm in my dressing gown. Yes, you are. 
where anything could happen. No. In the Russell T. Davis era of the show, when the Doctor and Rose fell in love, there was no indication that the Doctor was ever interested in Rose sexually, that he ever objectified her in the way that Matt Smith's Doctor did some of the women in his era. When the Davis Doctor did kiss a companion, it would be something spacey wacy like the genetic transfer with Martha. Forgive me for this, it could save a thousand lives, it means nothing. That was a genetic transfer. But Matt Smith's doctor is not just flirting, but grabbing women and kissing them without their consent. But when the internet started accusing Moffat of misogyny, he was confounded. He wasn't a right-winger, and he certainly didn't hate women. How could he possibly be a misogynist? As he put it, River Song, Amy Pond, hardly weak women. It's the exact opposite. You could accuse me of having a fetish for powerful, sexy women who like cheating people. You could, yes. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do. One of Moffat's early successes was Coupling, which premiered in 2000 and was a sitcom based on Moffat's own relationship with his wife, Sue, and the main characters were named Steve and Susan. Get it? Steve is a bumbling fool, overwhelmed by his typical masculine libido, and Susan is a cool, confident, sexy woman, in control of her sexuality and easily able to manipulate her boyfriend with it. And if this sounds familiar, it's because this blueprint seems to have been carried over to the relationships of Moffat's Doctor Who. See Amy and Rory, or the Doctor and River, or the Doctor and Clara, or the Doctor and Missy. Moffat's TARDIS was a very thirsty place. No longer did the companion live with the anxiousness of a teenager with a crush. Amy, River, and Clara were instead hot women who were powerful because they knew how hot they were and could steal a kiss whenever they wanted it, regardless of whether the men consented. When Amy decided she wanted to sleep with the doctor, she wouldn't take no for an answer, repeatedly kissing him and trying to undress him. Wow, such girl power. Clara showed us she was a tough cookie by making the doctor sexually uncomfortable. You get it, girl. And one of River's usual tricks is hallucinogenic lipstick, which she uses to kiss men into doing her bidding. To Moffat, a woman is strong and powerful because she's sexy, because she's a femme fatale. As he said of Amy, she likes a good time. I keep saying bad girl in the TARDIS, and now you know who her daughter is, and they're both just bad girls. She's naughty. Lol, okay Moffat, don't forget to mark your fanfic not safe for work. Oh, you bad, bad girl. But that's not to say women are just sexy fantasies in Moffat's work. As we all know, women can be scary too. Are you just saying yes because you're scared of me? Yeah. Love you. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I love you too. River destroys all of time and space just to remind the Doctor that he is loved before he dies. And he has to friggin' marry her just to get her to give it a rest. You embarrass me. And of course, if a boyfriend steps out of line, a woman has every right to slap him because women hitting men is perfectly fine. That's an all right message for kids watching. Could just slap him sometimes? Um, if the women are smacking their boyfriends, how is that not feminism? What is feminism if not women being sexy, shooting guns, and smacking their boyfriends? And like Steve and Susan from Coupling, there is one particular story Moffat seemed desperate to tell. It's called marriage, honey. We literally had, for a little while, two married couples in the TARDIS two. And they more or less had the same dynamic. Both couples are Steve and Susan from Coupling. When confronted with accusations that Amy's character is less well-defined because unlike her predecessors, she doesn't have a family or friends, Moffat replied, we see an active home life for Amy, her boyfriend, and her... Uh, I don't see what's different there. But before you get the impression that Moffat's work is too heteronormative, we have to talk about his queer representation. Amy, River, and Clara are all implied to be at least a little bit bisexual. River has dated women, Clara has apparently kissed Jane Austen, and Amy is seen to flirt with herself. None of them ever get to have a relationship with women on screen, and their attraction to women seems to mostly be a joke, but still, that's representation, right? Again, we can see iterations of this in Coupling, where Steve's ex is a bisexual woman, and his current girlfriend even makes out with his ex on one occasion specifically to turn Steve on. Wow. Who knew feminism could be such fun for straight men? These women's bisexuality isn't an identity or anything daft like that. It's an expression of their empowered female sexualities. Bisexuals don't need representation. As Moffat put it on Twitter, we don't acknowledge you on television because you're having far too much fun. You probably don't even watch because you're so busy. But things changed with the final companion of Moffat's era. Bill is a lesbian and is written completely unlike her predecessors. Her attraction to women is taken seriously and she isn't sexualized in the way that Moffat's other women are. In fact, if anything, she's written more like Rory and Steve, the awkward blokes who fumble when it comes to women. Except there is this one moment where Bill is on a date and she's brought this girl home and the other girl is nervous. Bill reassures her. I'm just not quite used to 
All of this. It is absolutely nothing to feel guilty about. Oh yes, this is how lesbians talk when they hook up, of course. There's nothing to feel guilty about, baby. We're not doing anything wrong. I can imagine exactly the type of movie Moffat stole that line from, and he probably bought it as a VHS tape from behind the curtain at the back of the video shop. But to be fair, Moffat also introduced the first regular lesbian couple to the show, a lizard woman from ancient history called Vastra, and her wife slash maid, Jenny. Their relationship is introduced as a cheeky gag about Vastra's long lizard tongue. I don't know why you put up with me. Stop. There's another gag where Jenny is posing in her undergarments for her wife, thinking she's being painted, but it turns out Vastra just wanted her to pose in her undies as decoration. Turn up a little. Oh, I don't understand why I'm doing this. Art? Just like Bill, who seems to be almost written like Rory, Vastra is written to be the chauvinist boyfriend to Jenny's pretty girlfriend. Even when Moffat introduces queer couples, it seems like he can only write them as if they were basically a straight couple. It's worth noting that Steve, Stephen Moffat's coupling counterpart, is obsessed with lesbians. It's a running theme throughout the series that he just can't resist a cheeky suggestion of lesbianism. And while I'm sure Moffat only made almost every single regular female companion in his era of Doctor Who bisexual or a lesbian for representation purposes, it is interesting that there are so few queer men. In the rare case that queer men are represented, they function primarily as a gag. There's Canton Everett Delaware, the third in one two-parter who comes out as having a male partner at the very end of the story in a gag to troll Richard Nixon. So that's one. And then, um, well, that's mostly it, except for the thin, fat, gay, married Anglican Marines who appear briefly before being murdered. I'm the thin one. This is my husband. He's the fat one. Don't you have names? We're the thin, fat, gay, married Anglican Marines. Why would we need names as well? Ha ha. It's such a good joke well done, but also those characters don't ever get names. The fat one is decapitated and that's it. They're credited in the episode as the thin one and the fat one, because in this future being gay and married is so unusual that no one even uses names for these characters. In Davis's era it was a tragedy not to know the name of a character when they were killed. But here it's funny because they're gay and one of them is fat. And I'm not saying that Moffat is homophobic, I actually, I don't think that's the case. But to Moffat, introducing queer characters is about being cheeky and off-centred, as he puts it. Contrast this with Russell T. Davis, who once said, I think science fiction is very much the preserve of heterosexuality, actually. Um, we look at it out, but shockingly so. And I'm very, very keen to push that further and to knock down those barriers, because I think it's one of my jobs on this earth. It's a slightly different vibe, where Moffat imagines a future where a gay couple where one person is thin and the other one is fat don't need names. Davis imagines one where sexuality and gender become fluid concepts. Ladies and gentlemen, and trees and multiforms. Ladies, gentlemen, multi-sex, undecided or robot. Ladies and gentlemen, a banana capillata. Ladies and gentlemen, and variations thereupon. But for Moffat, I think there is a reason most queer characters are women. Clara and River are bisexual because, as he said, it's cheeky and off-centred, and to him, a powerful woman is a bad girl. She's a woman who makes a man feel intimidated because she's so confident in her sexuality and he's so insecure in his. It's nowhere better exemplified than in Sherlock with Moffat's version of Irene Adler. To update the character for the modern world, he made her a lesbian dominatrix, albeit a lesbian who falls in love with Sherlock Holmes. That, he felt, gave her power. The original character was less feminist to him, so he took inspiration instead from a sexy femme fatale from a 70s Sherlock Holmes parody film. Because in the mind of Stephen Moffat, feminism and female empowerment come down to one thing, she is sexually dominant. And you know what, we're going to say more about this Irene Adler thing in the accompanying Patreon video, so if you want to support this channel please check us out on Patreon and consider supporting us. So where the empowerment of women in Russell T Davis era of the show had come from creating well-rounded characters with their own families and lives and stories, Moffat's was, at least in his first three seasons, about hot women from the perspective of the boys who wanted them to step on his face. Because that is what this nice children's show was really missing. But that's not to say Moffat is not a feminist. He definitely thinks of himself as feminist, at least. As he once said, I'm certainly no proselytizer for docile women, this heavily subscribed to myth. I don't know where it came from. I have never known a docile woman. You step through the door and you accept your junior status. Which I think actually summarizes exactly what he wants to do with Irene Adler. I think what's happened here is that he's completely misunderstood why people think he's a misogynist. It's not because the women are docile. It's because they're male fantasies. They might be active, toppy fantasies, 
but they're still fantasies, and often in roles which are supposed to be relatable to everyone, and especially small children. Either way, he seems to have at least taken on some of the feminist criticism later on in his era. Unlike River, who is married and dumped with unaging kids to look after for all eternity, or Amy, who is made to go through a horrifying pregnancy only to have her baby be taken away from her with no emotional consequences, Clara's final season isn't about boyfriends or babies or fancying the Doctor, but about how much she is like the Doctor and how dangerous the pair become together. It's the Doctor who loses his memory this time, and Clara goes off to have adventures in her own TARDIS. And despite a few awkward moments, Bill is certainly a refreshing take on the companion from Moffat. But also, Moffat began to make an attempt to, um, make his feminism more explicit. In Peter Capaldi's last episode, he brought back the First Doctor, and to highlight how much the times have changed, Moffat portrayed the First Doctor as a misogynist who wants Bill to clean the TARDIS and make tea, and threatens to spank her. Aren't all ladies made of glass? in a, a way. <laughs> if I hear any more language like that from you, young lady, you're in for a jolly good smack bottom. This doctor's also clearly uncomfortable with the idea of Bill being gay. And you can see what he was going for here. Look how different the modern doctor is compared to the sexism of the past. But to be honest, this version of the first Doctor is probably more explicitly sexist than the first Doctor ever was on screen. I actually personally really hate the idea that the first Doctor was a homophobic misogynist, and I don't think the original story, produced by a woman, and the first story, directed by a gay man, needed to be watched with that lens necessarily. But Moffat decided we need to, because it just highlights how progressive his version of the show is. But this is a great insight into how Moffat views sexism as a thing of the past. In his Sherlock Christmas special, The Abominable Bride, he shocks us all by revealing that the scary murder cult in pointed hoods are actually <gasps> feminists. It was feminism that did the murders, but it was actually a good kind of murder because life was so hard for women in Victorian times, no wonder they had to resort to murdering. Needless to say, many viewers were left unimpressed by the hardcore mansplaining. But this is it, what he thought of as real sexism. Sexism wasn't looking up Amy's skirt and then fantasising about two of her, it's about women's right to vote. Then again, in all fairness, he seems to have caught up a little bit in recent years. In his 2022 failure of a crime drama, Inside Man, the show opens with a scene of a woman being harassed on a train. Another woman pulls out her phone to livestream the abusive man, and then all the other women pull out their phones, and through the power of sisterhood they defeat the man and get the cops called on him. It's a fairly cringe take on the Me Too movement. It's very, and then everyone on the train started clapping. For Moffat trying to salvage his reputation and prove that he's not a misogynist, feminism has become about these moments, these statements. Is the future gonna be all girl? We can only hope. Feminism isn't embedded in his writing, it's turning to the camera to break the fourth wall and saying, women can be smart and strong too, just like men. Maybe even better in some ways, please step on me, mistress. One of his Doctor Who episodes is literally resolved by the discovery that a woman's uterus is what gives her power. Only an adult cis woman can power the spaceship because of the power of her uterus. I'm not exaggerating, that's literally the plot. You and I, Cyril, we're weak, but she's more than female, she's mum! How else does life ever travel the mothership? Moffat thinks of himself as a feminist, and his work seems to be torn between the desire to write what he thinks is hot, and his need to prove that he's actually super friggin' feminist. And before some bro leaves a comment saying, so what, am I not even allowed to even look at women anymore? I'm not allowed to be attracted to women? Of, co of course you're allowed to be straight, you poor suffering heterosexual. We're just saying that letting scripts be driven by fantasies weakens them. The women Moffat writes are not well-rounded complex characters. They tend to be silly wish fulfillments. The choices they make and situations they find themselves in don't make any sense. And it makes Moffat's work embarrassingly revelatory, like when you're watching a film with lots of foot shots and you're like, okay, I see what's happening here. <coughs> Blue is the warmest colour. But on the other hand, Moffat did give us the first gender transition for a Time Lord, perhaps proving that his gender essentialism wasn't quite as bad as we might have thought. The Master is the Doctor's oldest friend and longtime nemesis bent on universal domination. He called himself the Master because of his own vanity and his desire to conquer. But obviously, since Master is a gendered word, well, he couldn't possibly use that name for a female version of the Master. And Missy, short for mistress. Well, couldn't very well keep calling myself the Master. Now could I? But this was still really cool to see, and Michelle Gomez is absolutely brilliant and mesmerising in this role, 
absolute icon. In the past, the Master would usually try to take over the world or take over the universe with no regard for human life. Russell T Davis era established the Master as racist and homophobic, a perpetrator of domestic violence. Any cruelty he can inflict, he will. But now, with the new version of the Master, Missy, we had a version who wanted to take over just one thing. The Doctor's heart. Uh, hearts. Well, Okay, I guess that's two things. So Missy's evil plan is to create a Cyberman army, not by killing people, but by using people who are already dead. Then she plans to give this army to the Doctor as a gift, but she forgot that the power of love would cause the Cybermen to betray her. Whoops. Well, okay, that's a slightly softer version of the Master, but surely it can't get any softer than that. Except that it does. In Moffat's final season, Missy is imprisoned by the Doctor as he slowly convinces her of the importance of being good. And... It works! Missy becomes a good guy! For the first time in the history of the character, Missy has become good, at least in part because of what seems to be an awful lot like a romantic love for the Doctor. And this choice to characterise a female master as having a romantic longing for the Doctor isn't much of a surprise. Amy, River, Clara, all of Moffat's female companions, with the exception of Bill, the lesbian companion, romantically long for the Doctor. And of course, back in the 90s, Moffat wrote a parody of Doctor Who where a female version of the Doctor falls for a male version of the Master. This all seems consistent with Moffat's worldview that women are needy, men can go for longer, more happily without women, that's the truth. We don't, as little boys, play at being married. We try to avoid it for as long as possible. Meanwhile, women are out there hunting for husbands. Moffat has said that this quote was taken out of context, so I want to give him some benefit of the doubt, but it really feels like Moffat's Doctor Who, doesn't it? Suddenly, the Master is a woman and wants the Doctor to be her boyfriend. I guess it's entirely possible that if Moffat had written this version of the Master as a man, he would have done the same thing. I would be surprised if he would have gone for so much kissing between the Master and the Doctor if he had been a bloke, but I guess we'll never know. Maybe a male Master would have been even weaker than Missy because he didn't have a uterus. Moffat himself didn't seem to be in favour of casting the Doctor as a woman. When Helen Mirren said she thought the next Doctor should be a woman, Moffat replied, I like that Helen Mirren has been saying that we should have a female Doctor. I'd like to go on record. I think it's time that the Queen was played by a man. But his tune would change suddenly as his reign came to an end and the Doctor would finally regenerate into a woman, at which point everything went perfectly and nothing was ever wrong ever again. So, can the Doctor be a woman? Well, we know at least that the companion can be a man. In David Tennant's last story, for instance, Wilfred is the companion and hits all the same beats that the usual girl companion would. He asks questions, he connects with the audience, he gets into trouble, he needs the Doctor to rescue him. But can the Doctor really be a woman? I mean, being a white man usually travelling through British history, the Doctor doesn't tend to face the kind of discrimination a woman would. You want to explain your presence? and the nakedness of this girl. His social privilege has always been a defining characteristic of the Doctor. So what if the gender dynamics between the companion and the Doctor were flipped? What if the Doctor were a young woman and the companion a man? What if the hero of this show finally, after almost six decades, became a woman? Well, at this point I would argue we still don't know. Because instead of flipping the genders of the Doctor and Companion, Chris Chibnall announced his era would be an ensemble show with three new travellers, Yaz, Ryan and Ryan's granddad Graham, who were not companions actually, but officially the Doctor's friends. And without explicitly saying it, the show would gradually illustrate one strange truth about the first woman Doctor, that the Doctor was no longer the hero of Doctor Who. In this era, Everyone is the hero all the time. I've got tasks for you all. You've all got jobs. Team. Teamwork. It's a very right. flat team structure. Now the Doctor's job is to info dump, followed by saccharine speeches about the universe and friendship. Keep your faith. Travel hopefully. The universe will surprise you. Constantly. It's the live, laugh, love era of Doctor Who. With three companions, that's not a lot of room for this new Doctor to shine, let alone to have complex interpersonal relationships with each companion. Most of the time, if the Doctor needs to give a live, laugh, love speech or something, the companions all just stand in a row across the room and the dialogue is split awkwardly between them. What? What are you talking about? How's that possible? So what are the interesting dynamics among the new Team TARDIS? Well, at the beginning of the first season, Ryan doesn't want to call Graham Grandad because he's his step-grandfather. And then after a while, he does call him Grandad. So, th that's... Well, that's the main storyline of the season. Okay. Yaz is 
pretty unexpressive until the last few episodes after her third season, at which point she realises she has romantic feelings for the Doctor. And the Doctor is like, okay, that's nice, I'm gonna go die now. Bye! Rather than prioritise the complexities of a relationship between two people, we stand at an awkward distance from four people who we never really get to know. Ryan's big emotional scene with the Doctor after a long separation has the emotional resonance of a damp sponge. Where I'm from, all the lives I've lived, some of that has been hidden from me and I don't even know how much. Seriously? And how do you feel about that? After two seasons together, these people are like strangers, and I find myself wondering if this is the first time they've ever had a real conversation. Forget complex emotional interpersonal relationships and make room for shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder group hugs that leave room for Jesus. But does the Doctor at least save her companions, sacrifice herself to rescue them like the Doctor should do? No, not really. Usually if any of them need saving, it's all of them at the same time, including the Doctor herself, and then they all work together to save themselves. It's an equal partnership between four people, though to be honest they seem to have only one personality split four ways between them and most of that goes to Graham. There is no tension, no interesting dynamic of you saved me so now I'll save you. The complex dynamic of a privileged magic spaceman and a girl from Earth is just gone. Take this scene where the Doctor tries to send Rose home so she'll be safe, but she takes her limited space knowledge to find her way back to him, to rescue him, putting her own life at risk, saving the day, and then the Doctor trades places with her so that his life will end so that she can live on. Or the following season when the Doctor tries to send her to a parallel universe to keep her safe, but she refuses to go and comes right back, and the Doctor is angry, but Rose has made her choice, and it's complicated because she's a young mortal, and he's old and immortal, and he promised her mum he'd keep her safe and always send her home, but Rose gets a say in this because it's her life too, and yet this life is dangerous. That was the whole point all along, that this seems like fun, but people die every day getting involved with the Doctor, and it's only a matter of time before Rose is gone. What makes this work, what gives us this tension, is that the Doctor and Rose have different goals. The Doctor wants to save everyone from the Daleks regardless of his own safety, but Rose's goal is singularly on keeping the Doctor safe so that they can be together. Or in other examples, the Doctor wants to investigate the alien city while Ian and Barbara just want to get home. Or the Doctor wants to solve the mystery while Donna just wants to finish her wedding. And this can create tension, it can have characters at odds with each other, but if everyone is working towards the same goals, it just flattens the story. As in the 13th Doctor's second episode where the Doctor and her friends are all just walking through a desert towards the TARDIS and that is their only goal. They then find two other people who are also going in that direction and then they all just get there and that's it, that's the whole story and it's so, so boring. But that's what happens when you have four or more heroes with all the same goal. Even when tension is introduced in the final episode of their first season where Graham wants to kill the villain and the Doctor tries to discourage him, they have a brief chat about it then don't interact again until the end, when Graham just informs the Doctor after the fact that he decided not to kill him. And it's all just resolved, neat and tidy, with no real tension between the Doctor and Graham. Oh, I couldn't do it, Doc, yeah. I had the chance. Too weak. You're the strongest person I know. It's far more interesting when these differing needs directly contradict one another. To see the Doctor say, hey, I'm gonna use my special alien space magic to trick you into going home to keep you safe, and then to have Rose reply with, no, Fuck you, I love you. Maybe Chibnall didn't want any tension, maybe he wanted to make sure there weren't any uneven power dynamics between people of different genders or ethnicities, but it's boring. It makes for terrible drama. It's so unproblematic that it's dull, and the numbers prove it, people stopped watching. This era could easily have killed Doctor Who. And what this meant for the Doctor, the first ever woman Doctor, was that she was decidedly unspecial. People criticised it, saying it seemed like the Doctor wasn't the lead of the show anymore. Meanwhile, her first season revolves around the dull drama of Ryan trying to decide whether or not to call Graham Grandpa, and in later seasons it actually seems as though the Doctor spends more time being captured and in need of rescue than the men do. In fact, at one point she spends decades in prison and only escapes because a man rescues her. Why is this Doctor so rubbish? Chibnall? tried to change the formula of Doctor Who, and it just didn't work. This bloody format which caused us all so much grief, putting the woman every single time in the subordinate role to the Doctor, getting kidnapped over and over, when it was finally a man's turn to fill that role full time, we just dropped it. 
Graham didn't even get the chance to climb through caves in a short skirt. Where Moffat went hard on gender roles, I think Chibnall was trying to avoid anything problematic whatsoever, and it was with the best of intentions. And yet, once again, we end up with poorly written women in the show. And maybe at the end of the day, this is really a problem with the fact that we spent two decades just trying to decide which of three men are better at writing women. I think with Russell T Davis, we just got lucky that he is gay, and he brings a different perspective to the writing and how the companion engages with the Doctor. It feels as if he writes the companions as if he were the companions. Whereas Moffat seems to put himself in the position of the Doctor and likes to imagine all the hot things that could happen to him if all these sexy ladies were super attracted to his big, clever, throbbing brain. Both of these were very strong flavours of writing, and then Chris Chibnall brought a box of vanilla to the party and no one wanted any. But really, the best thing for this show would have been to have a woman showrunner, to give us something entirely new, to reimagine what it would be like to have a, a mad scientist lady with a time machine, with her plucky young male sidekick. What happens if you forget all these male archetypes and try to imagine the mad scientist as a heroine? Regardless of what's happened in the past and what happens next, there's always going to be room to try something new and exciting with Doctor Who. That's one of the great things about the show, there's always this chance for renewal. That's why it's lasted 60 years, because of its incredible capacity to evolve. And although the 13th Doctor might not have reached her full potential, she's set the stage for the future. There was a time when having a younger Doctor seemed ridiculous, but here we are. Whatever happens, I think Doctor Who will always revert back to this same formula, the magic alien with a box and the relatable companion. My hope is just that in the future we'll get to see that this isn't necessarily a gendered dynamic, that a woman can be the powerful magic alien, and it's okay for male characters to need rescuing every now and again. Fellas, is it gay to get captured by Daleks? I think and I hope that this tumultuous last decade was just full of growing pains that we'll get over in the years to come. As more women write for the show now than ever before, it's only a matter of time before we do have a woman in charge and get to see the whole thing from an entirely new perspective. But for now, I think the companions are in safe hands with Donna coming back and her daughter Rose and Ruby. I think the new Russell T Davies era will probably be fantastic while simultaneously pissing us all off and we'll all complain about it and make video essays about what we don't like, but I think it's probably going to be brilliant too. I really do. If you enjoyed this video, we're posting an appendix video on Patreon soon, so please consider supporting the channel on Patreon, otherwise please like and subscribe. Thank you so much to all of our patrons, and especially to Aaron Fisher, Aaron Hislop, Elecante, Aaron, A Fine Cup of Tea, AJ Mango, Alex Harvey, Alexis, Alfie Pampele, Alwyn, Amelia D, Anna, Andrew Cokemore, Angela, Angelique Bozio, Anya Stefan, Ariel Rodriguez, Artemix, Aurora Carabula, Basute, Bella, Beslaf, By Ronnie, Break Every Yoke, Bump Girl, CMB, Simois, Carl, Carmen, Carrie Not the Kind of Girl You'd Marry, Katrina Lexi, Charis Edwards, Chelsea S, Chloe G, Christine, CJ Gibson, CJK, Claire, Clemence Lavulier, Clement Fournier, Cleo McKeever, Comfort and Adam, Courtney Ray Kelly, Danielle Brabander, David, Dax, Deanna McMillan, Dennis Deems, Dijuel, Difolesserin, 120416, Dorothy, Eden Ladley, Irienby, Eleanor McDougall, Elizabeth Early, L, El Vanderit, L Like the L Word, Elora Will Misley, Elsie Astro, Emma Bales, Emery James Fairgreave, Edbier Strudel? That's Strawberry Strudel, right? Erica Nisland, Erica Ligren, Eve Griffith, Faye Crossroads, Fancy Angles, Fay Fay, Theo, Fickle Harpy, Fluffy Bunny Boo, Fox E, Frederica Ahrens, Gabriella Day, Gabriella, Gavin Salmon, Gerald Brenter, Ghost and You Might Die, Gillian Amotasor, Ginger, Giovanni Scaramelli, Grisella Farben, Gwilym Perez, Gwenda Euphoria, Hannah Acker, Hannah Burgess, Hannah Law, Hayley LeBang, HB, Hida, Harius of Eulethane, Hunka Munka, Issy Kostov, Jackie Queen of Thieves, Jackie Elise, Jamie, Jamie Midge, J.K. Jessage, isn't that isn't that a that's a island in Earthsea? Jetstorm, Gillian D, Joe Liss, Joe McManus, Josh D, Jules, Jules Inkwell, Juliana Baca, Julio Leote, Julio Mendez, Julia Sarwin, June September, Juniper Lopez, Caitlin Mrochka, Kale, Kata, Katarina Glomb, Katie Ballinger, Katrina Kaufman, Kata, Katya, Kaysera, Kelatua, Kelp. 
Claudina Cott, Kyle Denley, Lee Fowler, Leggett Rem, Lewis McLeod, Lee Hedstrom, Leanne Lairmore, Lindsay Mercer, Liron E, Lisa Spitalovitz, Lobster Mogster, Logan Kay, Lorelai McLaughlin, Los Tunas, Maddie Sale, Maeve O, Margarita Stella, Mary Bess, Marlon Olting, Mama Riyad, Marim, Math Class Warfare, Malka, Maxim Shulin, McKenning Wood, Meg, Melissa, Meredith Matthews, Merlin's Academy, Metavore, Mia Nilo, Minerva Gale, Mo, Mochibun, Moomin Puppet, Runmai Salil, Mathete, Miran McGlynn, Mickey, Nancia Fichter, Neil O'Hairen, Nicholas Venturo, Nick Snary, Nina, Nina Vongberg, Non Anonymous, Nora Carlson, Null Build, Oli Oli1234, Olivia Omar, Olivia Thiddeman, Oli Futa, Ossian Matthew, Pani Lin, Paper Samurai 00, Pelks, Pietro Serra, Pseudo Pac Man, Public L, Rachel Ratt, Rochelle, Radical Planning, Radon Rosborough, Reed Davidson, Rebecca Peacock, Reese Enghart, River Felix, River Haddock, Rolling Eddie, RSS, Ruxandra Greco, Salem, Safik Gushing, Sarah, Sarah Buchelman, Sarah R, Sarah R, Saria, Shokstopia, Scott A. Snellgrove, Sean Haskett, Selenia Latovara, Sean, Sierra Kaplan Nelson, Sierra Rhodes, Sylvia, Simon Patience, Sir Kiki, Sithvich, Soham Beneria, Solisil, Sonia J. Smith, soon to be Dr. Worm, Sophie, Spencer Sign, Starry Sunset, Steamy Mimi, Stefan Antoni Siedler, Stephen Wallace, Summertime Killer, Susie S., Talia Parkinson, Tara Welling, Teb9893, Tess McCrea, Taylor White, The Nihilist, The Swan Prinks, Theo Falling, Thistlecat, Thomas Ersing, Tiago, Tim Anderson, Tiny Wooden Tree, Tom Harrison, T.R.L. Andrew, Troy Zayer. Your Patreon credits are stressful to read through. Valeria. Verlux, Vicious Panda, Vicky Green, Victoria Cherepanova, Vince Whitaker, Vincenz Reinfeld, Wards, Wesley Botham, Will O'Connor, Yonatan Zunga, and Zet. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. What's happening? Last time I saw you, you were half cat. Man's allowed to experiment.